and welcome to another episode of Steelfer Speaks with, of course, me, Steelfer, adjusting my microphone um, to talk to you guys better. So today we're here with a guide now that we're moving into a series where, of course, national championships will have draft formats in. And that's something that people are going to have to be aware of. We're obviously moving into guides and basic guides for drafting. So for those of you who are a bit intimidated about draft for the first time, um, I want you to know it's actually a fairly straightforward process. Um, you will get eight people, um, seven people and yourself put into a pod um, at an event or you know your weekly game shop. You'll get three packs in front of you. You'll open the packs. You'll take one card um, after taking the token and just put it in the middle of the table. Uh, then you'll pass the pack to your left um, and, to, and you just keep taking a pack from your left, passing to your left until all the cards are gone. Then you'll open the. You'll have a minute or two to look at your cards because you won't be able to check during in a proper tournament. You won't be able to check during the event. And then you'll open your second pack, and you'll pass right. Um, again, taking one card, passing it on, and then do it for the last pack until you have forty-five cards in front of you. And then you'll take your deck and you'll build it thirty card minimum, and you'll play thirty-minute rounds until you have a winner. People find draft a bit intimidating um, because. It can go very wrong. You can take too many blues. You can take too many reds. Uh, you can not get enough class cards. You can not get enough element cards. I will say that for me, where we are now, Tales of Aria drafting is both A, forgiving, but also B, very flexible compared to drafting other sets of the game. Um, the ability to stay open is what we call it. So open is... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll do draft terminology as it comes up. Open basically means that you haven't yet committed to a point where you can't pivot, right? So a pivot is where you look at the cards you've got or you remember the cards you've got and you realize you can't play the original strategy that you were drafting to do. So in Flesh and Blood, that would be, I've been drafting to play Lexi. Okay, I'm not getting any Lexi cards. That means there's three other Lexis at the table. I need to change to play Briar, right? That's kind of what a pivot is. Um, and being open means that you haven't yet reached a point where you can't pivot. Now, what does that look like? In earlier Flesh and Blood sets, that doesn't really look like anything except a pile of generics in front of you. So if you're drafting Monarch and you have nine generics, then you're still what we consider open, though it depends what those generics are. Because obviously, if you've got Zealous Belting um, and you've got, or you've got Minoisms and Belittles, you're going to have a hard time pivoting away from the big attacking guys like Prism or Levia, and you're going to have a hard time pivoting away from the smaller attacking guys like Katsu and uh, Chain. So, you know, those some not all generics are as open as others. Not all elemental cards, ice cards, earth cards are as open as others. Um, and it's kind of important to remember that, that there are synergies within those cards that you kind of need to identify as well. But don't get too frustrated about that because any blue that is earth can be fused with and pitched if you get good class cards later on, right? So it's kind of just like this idea of how long can I stay open um, is, is important to kind of think about. So you're sitting there at the table um, and you're trying to think, okay, how do I stay open? And how do I draft well? Okay. And what does that look like for the current set that I'm drafting? So, you know, you sit down, you open up your pack, and there's a group of cards in front of you. Um, I've just mixed all of my packs in together from the sealed deck that I just did. Um, but okay, so you've got, say, um, some earth cards, some ice cards. Um, you're trying to stay with this idea of openness for at least, at least we'll say five or six pulls. Now, remember that I'm giving you general advice here. There are some cards that are genuinely worth just slam committing to straight away, right? Let me bring up, let me bring up FabDB and we can talk through what that kind of looks like. So, right, so let's just go. So. Uh, that's cards. Let's go to TOA. Right. So if you're thinking like what cards will make me hard commit to a class, right? And that's kind of like what we're talking about. Is it Blossoming Spellblade? Are you ever gonna are you ever gonna fuse this? Bramble Spark Red is a good card for thinking, okay, maybe I just need to play Rune Blade. I've opened a Bramble Spark, I'm just gonna hard draft Rune Blade. Um you know, none of these other ones, Burgeoning, Buzzbolt, Channel Lake Frigid, maybe it is that strong, but it is only one card in the deck. 
um but it could be good maybe it's your legendary and you're just like i really want to play this legendary um but you'll notice if you look through there's very few cards that will make you hard commit to a class straight away when you could say take something like a red electrify or an earth law surge and still be open between say bravo and not bravo uh, old him and um briar or briar and lexi you know and you still keep that flexibility stuff like an evergreen obviously works better in decks with more blues um you know you might see an explosive growth red you might want that is it really a hard commit card that's the thing um something like a flicker wisp could be something like a heart of ice definitely is you know if you see this in your pack one pick one you just take it and you go ice but let's assume you don't have one of these bombs like this heart of ice or a flicker wisp or you know you don't have a lighted up or something like that you're probably your best bet is just to draft the best elemental card in the pack in front of you so for example what would that look like heaven's claw red amazing um electrify red yellow even blue is amazing but electrify red or yellow is probably better um in ice you have obviously got your um winter's bite um ice quake is quite good as well um not really icy encounter winter's grasp the one that blocks for three very good polar blast is very good um you could also see something like an overflex which is just really good for buffing arrows and can kind of push you towards an early pick into ranger um and i'm not going to review like loads of pack one pick ones because i don't have a booster simulator here which would make it really easy um yet i think he's getting one um because obviously you know we need a booster simulator um yeah, and he hasn't got that up yet. But I know he'll be adding it soon. So when he's added that, we can do a more in-depth dive and review like pack one picks ones. But unfortunately, as you can tell, I have opened a lot of... Let's just say... Let's just do the fan. I have opened a lot of tails. And I... Um, this is mostly Cold War Commons, by the way. I don't think this is a massive flex. Um, uh, and also some stuff from older sets. So again, not really a massive flex. But... Um, I've opened a lot of tales and I did not record pack one pick ones for any of that. But I do I can tell you about my pack one pick ones today, right? Because I did three drafts today and one on Friday as well. So if we go, what were my pack one pick ones for today? The first one was turn timber, which of course is the red. I drafted the red, pack one pick one. Um defense reactions in this format with so much dominate are massive. Um and having that option available to you. Sorry, I'm dropping my nerds. I'm eating nerds right now. I'm still eating them from the last video. Um, no, I recorded both of these together. If you've watched the previous video about tales um, of the creators of Aria Sealed and you're like, why is he wearing the same shirt? I record them both on the same night and then put them out at different times. I'm a very practical person that way. Because um, I get an evening free. I'm choosing to record the videos. And I have a lot to say. So I took Turn Timber as my pack one pick one in one of them. In the other one, it was a bit cheating because I took a Frost Storm. Or an ice storm that's it yeah and then i just drafted ranger to play it which was a bit cheeky um but to be fair in that one i didn't actually intend to draft ranger i took it because it's a casual draft so i just rare drafted but when it came down to it there were two red arrows going around um a bit so i was like well i'm taking those um and my other pack one pick one was this card which i think a lot of people underrate um a lot of people underrate the blue one not so much but the red and the yellow are amazing um we're in a format where there aren't really a lot of defense reactions and this is basically the earth defense reaction if you're not playing bravo they're not playing ultim so i basically took this red one as my pack one pick one because it's a zero for plus four and this saved me numerous times versus dominate so that's kind of what you're looking for from your pack one pick one is a card that's either keeps you open so just keeps you it's just an earth card an elemental card it's not a class card gives you options for what you're going to do build your deck like for example you you really don't want to be in that situation you can be in that situation you can change where you've taken like a bramble spark and then no one gives you any rune blade cards and you have to change it's a fine situation to be in it's important to change when you have to and realize when you have to change like, if you are drafting Briar, and even if you take a Bramble Spark, pick one, and you get to pick five, and there is not a single um, other Briar card in the set, you just need to switch. 
to whatever there is a lot of, right? And just accept the loss of those five cards, even if they were amazing, right? Or alternative strategy, hard draft, the earth, and the lightning cards, and hope that you pull some Briar stuff in later packs. But really, a pivot is quite a good thing to consider and to keep an idea on. So, yeah, I would definitely start off just by drafting the strongest elements in your first pack. And then basically, from there, you move into a class. Around pack four or five, pack, pick four or five in pack one, where you see what big hits are coming to you from your left. And this is kind of, okay, so this is kind of important. So we talk about reading a draft, right? This is a very important thing to learn if you want to get good at drafts at a competitive level. So reading a draft is essentially the idea that you are going to try and figure out, based on what's coming to you, what your opponents are playing in a draft. And this is an incredibly essential part of drafting well, right? Because people who just draft casually and just want to play their favorite hero in the draft will just try and force. And when you say force, that means with more acronyms. So forcing is basically where I will draft this class regardless of what comes to me. And that means that I will take every Earth card, every Lightning card, and every Runeblade card I see. And I don't really care what I get, right? Because I know that that's the best deck, even with bad cards. And therefore, all I have to do is just draft even the bad cards of that set. And I will win regardless, right? Kind of like Prism in Monarch. Um, but that's not true in Aria. I really can't help but like emphasize and dissuade people of the notion that that is true in Aria. A lot of people were like, oh my god, Briar and Sealed is amazing. She'll smash faces. And in Sealed, that is true, right? Briar and Sealed is imbalanced. A bad Briar pool can beat a, a, an average pool from any of the other heroes easily. Um, but in limited, in draft, that is not the case, right? If three people in a draft force Briar, so take every single Briar card, leave nothing for anyone else. The other people who are splitting the remaining two classes, let's say it's four people in an eight-person draft. So say half of your draft tries to force Briar, which is kind of the um, the percentage of Briar that were in the top eight of the, the, the recent calling. Um, the other half that is splitting those two classes equally between them are going to have much, much better decks and will uh, destroy the briars when it comes down to it it's not that there still won't be some variants or some briar guy person who gets better cards but in general if you're drafting a good deck for either of the heroes you can win it's not just briar deck wins or briar wins every time right so that is important to note there is not a class that i would recommend forcing um that's not to say i wouldn't recommend setting out with an idea of what you prefer to play that's kind of important to get an understanding of your own game plan and obviously that means if there's a choice between two options, you're going to know which one you want to choose and which one you want to play. But I don't really believe in forcing a class or taking every one of a class every time just because that's the class you want to draft. I think that can lead you down to some very bad drafts. You obviously might get lucky and open the good cards and then no one else can take you from them. But if you force Briar and four other people also force Briar, or if you force Lexi and so do other people, you are going to end up with some problems, which is that you just won't have enough cards and you'll be passing up very, very good cards for other classes in order to keep that force of alive. And if you forced very early, then you're obviously not going to get the cards you want. That being said, a lot of draft does depend on signals, right? Signals is like reading. It's Signals are what you get from your opponent and not what you read, right? You, right they are what you read. So... If I'm drafting, I can send signals to the people next to me when I'm passing them a pack. That signal might be leaving a very obvious um, red card for a class I do not want to play. Or alternatively, so they, they don't take the cards when the packs reverse. and they go. So basically, if I, in my first pack, take the strongest Runeblade card, and there is obviously one Runeblade card missing... The person to my left, who I pass that pack to, should be able to tell that and therefore will not take the Runeblade card themselves. They'll take something else, they'll take an element, they'll take a different class. If I pass them a very strong Runeblade card, they may in fact take the Runeblade card and start drafting Runeblade themselves, which, which is where draft gets complicated. 
can be a good or a bad strategy depending on how you are playing the draft, right? If you are starting a draft to someone's right, you're passing them the first and the last pack, and you force them into a class that you are also drafting, you will get the good cards, and every card will go through you, which means that you will basically get to dictate whether or not they have a good draft or not. It doesn't always work. There's often packs that have two cards in. And if you're both taking the cards from the same class, none of them will be going around the table, so other people may shy off them. And being next to someone who's drafting the same class doesn't necessarily guarantee that they have a bad draft. It really can go either way. But it is one way to play the game of drafting. Personally, I think if you're sending clear singles to the person to the left of you, the main reason to do that is so that people don't take that class, so that when the packs shift around and you're going right, you have a clear swath of people to your left who aren't going to take the cards away from you, right? It's harder to control what people are drafting upstream, i.e. to your right, because you're not passing anything in their direction. But you can read the signals they are sending you. Like, for example, leaving a strong Runeblade card in the pack may push you to drafting Briar. Obviously, a certain amount of mind games are not taking the cards that are, you know, blatantly obvious. But equally, they may not just be on that class, so that may be fine. Um, typically, if you're getting good cards for the class consistently, um, that is why you commit to the class. But you have to make that decision at the right time so that someone else doesn't commit to it before you do. And suddenly you're competing with class, with a class for with three other people rather than just having the cards for yourself. So that's kind of important. Um, there's a whole thing you can do about timing pivots and timing when you choose your hero and when you lock in. Locking in is when you go to a point that you can't pivot anymore. Um, or when you, um, you know, choose a hero and that's going to be your hero. So you kind of just have to start taking those cards um, or you won't have a playable deck without crack baubles. Um, some people do just hard lock, um, which is basically just like forcing where you get a card in your first pack. That's so amazing. Like Oak and Old, you're just like, screw it. I'm going to draft everything from Oak and Old that will turn on this card and you just go with it. And, you know, that can be a viable strategy, but obviously it has its pitfalls because if multiple people decide to do it very early on, then you have problems. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the structure of the draft. Um, drafting is very different from sealed if you haven't had much practice with it because by the time you finish your draft, you should ideally have... 40 playable cards i mean it's good it's it you know you're not you're going to have some cards that aren't playable um unless you know people are drafting really badly and you just get handed every card at the end of the deck that's the hero you wanted um you're typically gonna have um unplayable cards uh but really it should only be somewhere between the 35 45 card range that's what we talk about a pivot because if i draft 10 cards i can't use and then i pivot i've still got 35 cards i can play right so that's fine but you have to account for the um the end of pack cards, which may not match up with what you want, and kind of factor in how you're going to handle that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like the basics of draft. Obviously, it gets a bit more complicated. You kind of have to figure out what your what the signal cards are. Like Rites of Lightning is a signal card. If you get past that after a couple of packs, no one is taking Rune Blade. Bramble Spark Red is. Um, you've obviously got the Majestics, though at a higher level, people aren't necessarily going to draft the Majestics, so they will tell you a lot of what people are going to be playing. If, for example, you get past a Seek and Destroy on a couple of picks in, you know that no one to your right is playing Rune Blade. Same thing goes, sorry, playing Ranger. Same thing goes for stuff like Sigil of Suffering Red um, or Yellow. Same thing goes for stuff like Sting of Sorcery. Sometimes if you get a Majestic, you can just tell that no one has taken it. Uh, I saw a Terra Sunder for zero reason table earlier today. Um, and I was absolutely shocked. There should have been two Ultim drafters in that, but two people were forcing Briar. Again, because the perception that Briar is stronger than other heroes, which I don't think she is. And therefore, one Bravo, well, the one Ultim player got Terra Sunders and everything else that he wanted. All right, so you have to be very careful of that. You don't want to give one person everything they want. It's really risky. Um, be aware of like CC setup cards. Tome of Harvest can be good, but it also can be very bad if you don't have time to Arsenal something. And this can be quite a fast format. Voltaire as well has similar problems. It can work if you get it early enough to just draft non-stop arrows. But it is also a CC setup card. Something like Winter's Whale isn't. If you get Winter's Whale, just play play Ultim. Um, even if you get it in like the start of pack two, just pivot if you've taken any ice or earth cards. Um, it's really that good. And then just take as many ice cards as you can. Um, 
yeah so just like be aware of like cc trap cards i will say not many of those exist um in this set because it seems to have been drafted heavily with um with drafting in mind but stuff like frost lock and things like that aren't necessarily as good in in limited as they are in, in cc um exposed to the elements is a good example as well though the earth side of this sorry the ice side of this where you can blow up someone's zero strength equipment is actually quite huge um especially if someone has somehow drafted the ram's head shield you can just pop it so there are interactions like that that it's good to be aware of um other than that you want a good mix of blues reds yellows this set pretty much requires you have a decent number try and get 10 to 12 of each don't be afraid of taking bad cards if they're blue um just to get the blues in the elements you need so earth or ice or just to get more blues that you can play um ultimately your mana curve you know the games are long enough but any card you don't really need can be blocked with and it's important to understand that like a blue arrow that you can pitch also blocks for three almost all the class cards do block for three so don't be afraid to pick up some blue blizzard bolts if you haven't got a better pick in the pack or some blue um dazzling crescendo at a push you can attack with it but at the very least you can block with it the one thing i will say just on top of that advice is that the blocking in this set is incredibly important um do not underestimate the power of the three block um there are so many cards that don't well i mean i'm looking at bolt ball lightning but also like awakening blizzard blink there's so many cards in the set the amulets as well that don't block that actually having those three blocks is huge um there's so loads of cards that block for two as well especially the element cards which you need a lot of so having the three blocks is huge and you really want options when it comes to blocking because there will be times when it is the right answer to just take a big hit but most of the time because of a 20 life in the format the correct answer is in fact just to block the big hit arsenal something set up a bigger turn come back you know after a turn or two after blocking and then do your big hit rather than you know just um just you know taking the hits to do damage because usually there's no amount of damage you can do unless you've got a really really god turn or you clinch the game out with the turn right that's going to be so good as to be worth taking serious amounts of damage for in a format where you already have 12 life and a lot of your cards block for two and there's a lot of dominate right and that's kind of important to remember as well about drafting tales of aria and drafting in general um your deck is a lot less consistent your desk deck blocks for a lot less you can't rely on it to keep your health up on the turns you need to so you need to keep your health up on the turns where you can and then use that to carry yourself over into the turns that you need to right and that means blocking more than you should avoiding taking too much damage unless you have really really good hitbacks or a really really good strategy to deal damage in return and that means basically controlling the speed of the game by blocking when possible leading to you to in a situation where you can land your big hits without worrying about dying because remember fuse is very important um you know you need to fuse to get the really good hits off but you're going to have to take damage to fuse because that's a card you're not blocking with you need to build up the life to give yourself sorry i'll stop eating these now um they're really good though um the nerds you need health to be able to give yourself the reach to fuse on the turns you really really need to so if you're looking at your hand and being like this is a good hand but you know they're attacking me with a mulch for eight this is a good hand but i can only deal four damage but i've got this polar blast here the correct solution is to block as much of the mulch as you can arsenal the polar blast and don't try and do the four damage and then next turn you've got a polar blast at arsenal and maybe you draw your overflexes and then suddenly you're going to come in with an overflex polar blast arrow maybe it get it gets dominate because they don't pay that means you can give it plus one shiver you're coming in for with a five arrow with plus four five and suddenly that bad turn turns into a really good turn you kind of need to be thinking at that level in the draft but also while you're drafting where are the threats actually coming from are they coming from seek and destroy are they coming from buffs are they coming from just big smacking attacks like in in um like in ultim you know um so that's where i'm going to leave you all now i hope you've really found this useful and found like some very good draft advice here um i hope it's brought you up to speed on some of the keywords i will say about drafting that it is a bit intimidating at first but the more you play it the more you'll naturally find yourself reading signals and understanding what's going on so don't be put off by it just do it with your friends try and figure out what they're playing about and talk about it afterwards um 
It's a really fun game um, for you all to just sort of stop before anyone shows any of their cards and just to say or guess what you think the other people at the table were drafting. And you'll realize after a while that you actually start to be correct when you're saying these things. And people will be like, yeah, yeah, that's what I was drafting. And in that way, you'll kind of learn that your your tells are accurate. You know, your 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 what you're reading is accurate. And you'll learn to really predict what people are picking. You'll get it wrong sometimes, but that's kind of how you learn is to kind of um, deny that information to yourself. I will also say that like, some casual drafts do let you look at your pool in between um, picks. If you are serious about trying to win at, say, competitive level events, I would start teaching yourself now to not look. Um, and I think this is the last sort of bit we'll talk about before we leave. But basically, if you can't look during competitive tournament, don't look during casual. Teach yourself to memorize a few ideas that you need from your in-between pack reviews, right? So, for example, um, today when we were drafting, after pack one, I had a solid base of lightning cards. So I said to myself, but I didn't have that many blues. Um, I said to myself, okay, I need more blues and I need class cards, right? I've got enough lightning, I need lightning fusion. And I just went into pack two with those notions in my head of, okay, I'm looking for powerful cards, um, but I also need this and this, just two specific things I need from that go around of the pack. And then um, for pack three, I did the same thing. I looked, okay, I've got enough blues. I've got enough lightning. I've got enough lightning fusion. I've also picked up some ice fusion cards that are really strong. What do I need from pack five, pack three? I need ice. So then I start drafting ice from the start of the pack. And it is worth it in this set, making sure you have enough of the elements as well as enough of your pitch because fusion is so important. Um, you can get away with not fusing if you have like lots of these strong attacks like Autumn's Touch, Heaven's Claw, etc. But generally fusing is going to be better than not. Okay. Um, so it's worth just realizing that getting the good attacks is good. Getting the fusion is good. And just doing that to yourself by practicing, by not looking in between the pulls um, when you're drafting. But instead trying to come up with one, two or three just lines every time you look at your pack in between the next pack of what your goals are for the next pack that comes around. And obviously that could be blown out of the water by a bomb card you're going to take instead of matching your goals. But as long as you roughly stick to the goals you've set yourself um, and you, you, you internalize them before you start drafting, um, you will basically get the cards you need from those packs because you'll be thinking i know i need an ice card so i'll take this ice card over this other one right and that's really what it is about it's about making sure you're giving yourself the blues you need and the ice cards you need by just reminding yourself before you go in to each pack what your main two or three goals are from that pack and you know you might see a channel mount heroic and you might just slam it down even though you said actually i need ice cards for old him that's fine it's fine. I mean, you, you should never not draft the best card, but sometimes you're going to have a choice between two average cards or you're going to have a choice between, um, you know, one OK card and one slightly bad card. But the bad card is a blue lightning card. Right. You know, and, you know, having enough blues is always better than having another amazing red. Right. Because you can't play it. So you've got to just kind of keep that in mind. Anyway, that is my drafting advice. Obviously, if you have any questions, do please just put them in the comments. Yeah, so as I was saying, I have, I've hit 600 subscribers now, which I'm obviously over the moon about. So thank you everyone who has joined, liked, and subscribed recently. Um, I'm seeing just some great traction on these videos and people have been saying to me at events, I'm really enjoying them or saying to me on, on Discord, like I've really been enjoying your, your videos. So I'm going to keep doing them. Um, you know, I really like this casual chat format. And obviously we have the Steel First Supremacy, which are more constructed, um, competitive focused ones. Though I wanted this draft advice to be accessible to everyone, which is why I haven't marked it as a specific competitive video. Though there is advice scattered through here for people who want to draft competitively as well. So I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please do let me know. And obviously I will try and answer them in a subsequent video later on. Thanks everyone for listening and see you all soon.